Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome SBI Podcast listeners and video podcast viewers. My name is Christina Dickmeyer and I'm the Director of Marketing at SBI, a sales and marketing company dedicated to helping you make your number. I am joined by my co-host, Mike Drapeau, partner at SBI, and Kevin Avery, senior consultant at SBI. This is a weekly show, and its purpose is to help you make your number as we debate some of the most pressing topics that senior executives are facing. Welcome to the show. Today's show is titled, Are You Too Quick to Pull the Comp Trigger? and centers on how you decide what to pay your people, specifically those responsible for driving growth. We cover the topic of compensation planning in detail in our report, How to Make Your Number in 2016, on pages 178 to 179, if you'd like to follow along. So let's get started. I wish I had a nickel for every letter we get about compensation planning. Here's just one that captures our point today. Sean, the VP of Sales Ops at an information technology company, writes, We haven't made any major changes to our incentive compensation plan in several years, either for the sales or marketing departments but the new VP of sales wants to make that an area of focus of hers. I have been tasked with finding out the right changes to make, but I'm concerned a new plan might spook some of our higher performers. What do you suggest? Kevin and Mike, what would you say? How can he know the right next step in terms of compensation planning? Yo, Sean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, No, obviously we're gonna be a little more thoughtful than that. But um, really, seriously, to to net out my thoughts, Compensation is the last lever I'd pull. Um, Sequencing matters. If you look at our five-step sales strategy methodology, uh, compensation comes sort of toward the middle. There's probably 70 things that you ought to do or think about before you actually start fiddling with comp. I won't say never, but I'll say almost never. So Um, I would, I'm sorry. Just one more thing. Um, The the thing I would would, uh, um, recommend that you do is that you get upstream alignment and then use comp as the last stroke, the icing on the cake. Well, Sean, the first thing I would say is respect your fears. I appreciate you sharing them and you're concerned that something could go awry. And uh, of all the different sorts of improvement projects that I've seen over the years, the one that I have seen fail the most reliably is compensation um, improvements, compensation changes to the plans. And it's not surprising because it's really sort of like the third rail of Salesforce effectiveness. Touch it, move it, and the chances that you die go up significantly. So be wary. Yeah, so I'd like to address my next comments specifically to sales leaders, heads of sales, and even to CEOs because I think both of these people um, tend to like to push the comp button and maybe should be a little bit um, more wary of doing that. Um, the best sales leaders know that there's a tremendous number of fallacies um, and simplistic mantras in the sales world. And the best leaders know that one of the biggest ones, one of the most deeply entrenched sort of conventional wisdoms that is not, is that compensation drives behavior. Now, before you throw up on me, um, w- <laughs> what makes this particular thing so pernicious is that it's partly true. Compensation can drive behavior to some extent. And anytime there's nuance, it's, it's more difficult. Um, but the key is, it seems like the easy button, especially when you're flush, if you've got money to throw around. Um, but it's overused, and there's often better remedies, and it often doesn't deliver you the results and may, may result in unintended consequences. Let me share two sides to this coin with you. Uh, I did some work with a company where they did a four times multiplier to pump up sales of a relatively new product. You know, I told them that it wouldn't work, and in fact, it was a dud. Now, am I a genius? <laughs> trust, trust me, not in the least. True. Um, uh, frankly, people on Mars could see that it wouldn't work. Why? Because the sales force felt fear and loathing for the product. Um, it was launched prematurely. Um, it had tons of quality problems. Worse, it touched the customer's customers. So the customers had their hair on fire. Um, they were up in arms, and so, you know, uh, sewage rolls downhill. Um, and so the salespeople were spending tons of time on critical account calls, you know, their customers in the intensive care unit and that kind of thing. And of course, the, the, the customers were holding other deals hostage. It's horrible. Now the answer was what? To fix the product. Um, there was no Salesforce magic and no comp juju that was going to remedy that situation. Well, and then on the flip side, 
When a salesperson is very comfortable with the product, and especially if there's a strong pull from customers for it, salespeople will sell it almost irrespective of what you pay them. You could pay them virtually nothing. They're still going to just go through and sell that com comfortable product. So the rub in this case comes when you want them to shift their focus to other products that require more time, effort, and skill. Um, compensation is often inadequate on its own to drive that sort of change. You know, Kevin, um, I find that comp is far from a miracle cure, but it can be curative. It all depends. So what I would recommend doing is get to the heart of the issue. Um, and in so doing, you can either head off or maybe even accelerate the rush to change the plan. It all depends. So in speaking to Sean, what I would say is, hey, Sean, so that you can be responsive to new VP of sales and what she wants, I would ask that you look at several different possibilities and present these to her to get a response that allows you to do whatever falls out of that discussion. So the first thing is, what is the behavior change that you're looking for from your reps? What specifically do you want them to start doing next year and stop doing that they've been doing now? So outline that. Number two, ask yourself, what is deficient about the plan right now? What about the current plan is so bad that it will prevent you from making your goals next year? Identify that. Be specific. Then ask yourself and get answered, do all the reps understand the plan? Is it clear? Is it basic enough that they can repeat it back to you with ease? Or is it so complex they don't even worry about it? They just get paid and they just let the details figure themselves out. Also ask yourself, how many high paid performers are you willing to lose? 5%, 10%, all of them? Because when you change the plan and you run the forward and backwards modeling, you're going to lose some of those high paid players. What's the damage to your business that might result? Also, look at territory potential. Oftentimes, people rush to judgment on the comp plan, but what they're really saying is, you know what, my territories aren't balanced. I have way too much potential in this territory and not enough in the other one, yet the same comp plan applies to both. That's not fair, and you would be right. So maybe you can get many, or if not all, the objectives <coughs> attained by adjusting territory potential by rep and adjusting the account allocations that come with territory potential. And lastly, are you willing to invest in some form of automation, some form of a tool that gives you Better ability to administrate with, with less uh, comp, uh, fighting and sort of the exception conditions that always seems to come into play. Yeah. And then lastly, um, the calculators. I think sometimes management underestimates how much time reps are, are, are spending calculating their, comp, their personal compensation on each deal. But they have these very sort of robust, personally generated calculators. If you can offer something that's plugged into the plan, it takes all that friction away. That's, those are my recommendations. Great point. You know, I think the... Um, what resonated with me when you said um, the territory <coughs> potential, I was working with a client that uh, we, were, we were doing account segmentation, so part of the marketing research strategy, which is the first leg in the six-step step, um, revenue growth um, uh, methodology. And in terms of, uh, we were looking at their current state territories, mm -hmm. and we calculated that two territories, right, we each carried, carried by a rep, one territory had $21 million of account, annual account potential. The other territory had $4 million of account potential. What's wrong with this picture? Now, they didn't exactly have the same comp, but it wasn't anything like in balance. Mm -hmm. You know, the one guy had uh, a, comp uh, a quota that essentially, if he just did what he did last year in one part of his market, he was going to make his number. The other guy, poor guy way in the hinterlands of West Virginia, yep. um, you know, his, he, what, he, had a, he had a quota that was half the size of his of his entire market potential. So the problem there wasn't comp, the problem there was quota. All right, great points by, points by both of you. So here's what I take away from that. First and foremost, you need to get to the root of the problem, and only then can you move to a properly designed incentive program that will attract top talent and motivate the desired behaviors. We cover the issue of compensation planning extensively in our blog. For instance, this article, Measuring the Success of Sales Compensation Plans, underscores the points Kevin and Mike have made today. Let's take a quick break and let our listeners know how to subscribe to the SBI blog. We'll be right back. Each day, you receive hundreds of emails, tons of text messages, countless telephone calls, and sit in too many meetings. How do you find ideas to make the number with all this noise. The SBI blog filters all this nonsense for you and presents only first-rate ideas to make the number. Simplify your life. Subscribe to one blog and read the best content. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com and subscribe today.
Welcome back. My name is Christina Dickmeyer, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Mike Drapeau and Kevin Avery, for today's show, Are You Too Quick to Pull the Comp Trigger? Before the break, Mike and Kevin shared with us their opinions on the importance of ensuring that a change in the compensation plan is warranted, given that much can go wrong if it's not well conceived. Mm. Let's dig into this a little deeper, but shift to the side and consider a topic not often discussed in this arena, pre-sales compensation. We received the following question from a viewer, Cheryl, the VP of Presale Engineering at a $1 billion software company, and she said, I would like to approach the sales leader and propose a more leveraged plan for myself. Currently, I am compensated as most, most VPs are, salary and some MBOs, but I believe I am driving top line improvements with our programs and I want to participate in the gain. What do you recommend? Kevin and Mike, what would you recommend? Oh, ho, ho. welcome to the dark side, Cheryl. Indeed, the dark side. And, you know, in, in thinking about this, I am brought back to the fact that in my previous life, one of my previous lives, I ran pre-sales teams for a large technology provider. So this is really an intimate question for me. And back then, conventionalism would have said, uh, no, disregard the need for compensation plans that have high leverage for the pre-sales team. Just let them keep on plugging with their MBO plan. And, but that's old thinking, particularly based upon all the changes that occurred. If you think about it, the pre-sales teams of today uh, they're the pointy tip of the spear of demand gen. They're out there engaging prospects early. They're following the sales process and executing multiple different independent steps along the way. Yep. They're romancing the technical staff, which takes some doing, let me assure you. <laughs> they're teaching prospects. Uh, they're stimulating interest in the current customers for new solutions. They're really in the battle, in the fray with the sales team. And they're growth partners with sales, fundamentally, so why not accept the more leveraged compensation? At, at one level, it makes sense. And for me, it's easiest to start with the roles that are sort of the closest to the revenue stream. For that would be the pre-sales engineers. Uh, they're sort of the one that comes out as the best example to start with to see if you can build a leverage plan for them. Yep. But in, you may also be tempted to go to the technical architects. They're sort of a higher uh, a breed version of the pre-sales engineers. Why not compens compensate the technical architects in the same way? Go, why? They, they're building the solutions in real time with customers breathing down their necks in the competition around the corner. They're overcoming objections with the, the, the tech staff of the clients and sometimes a, an aggressive and antagonistic technical staff. They're ensuring that whatever solution gets designed uh, is designed in such a way that has a maximum probability of success and therefore ongoing account development and new sales. So they are absolutely instrumental in the sales game. So. Then you say, all right, well, that's, a, that's an upside, but there's a downside. And this is the, the second half of the story that oftentimes the, the pre-sales leaders don't want to hear about, which is um, many pre-sales professionals are not used to this sort of severe accountability that comes with a uh, highly leveraged compensation plan. If you don't make your number, you don't get paid. And the money that you bring home to the household is significantly less than maybe expectations you set. And so if you want to take that plunge as a group, maybe as a leader and as a, and as a group working for the leader, you have to be accept the sugar with the salt. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely right. And that's a, huge, that's a huge thing that on paper it looks great and on the grass it's shite, as the, as the British would say. Um, you know, Mike, you really nailed that first point. Um, sales support, one thing we need to unthink um, or at least rethink is, you know, is in my company the sales support role Last show and tell, configuration jockeys, um, proposal prep, things like that. Mm -hmm. If, as you say, they're out engaging members of the buyer decision team, if they're working independently, if you've got a buyer process map and, and a sales process, um, you'll know this because you'll have, you'll have a separate role called out for major interactions and that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, being driven by the, by the technical side of your sales team. Um, you know, the other thing is I think accountability and measurability is, um, and as well as comp, um, have tended to remain in the old world, mm -hmm. um, but so I think it's time for a change. Um, and spot on about the emotional aspect, and this is not trivial. Um, you know, I, I'm all T and no F on the Myers-Briggs <laughs> scale, so I, 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 this is a particular weak spot of mine. I'm like, get over yourself. Um, and um, so, but it would be useful to know for, for me, uh, if I'm a sales, sales leader, how much of the um, bonuses, the MBOs and things like that, mm -hmm. if you're even on a plan that's not 100% salary, um, how much of them have been over-glorified entitlements? Because I find a lot of MBO plans in our clients have been um, something that has become shadow salary. They're just salary. Yep. And which means that they are not used to having any downside. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, so I'd tap the brakes a little bit. 
Um, you know, so here's my advice if, uh, to you sales leaders out there, uh, if you're contemplating going down this path. I'd want to take it a little bit slow and consider a couple of things. One is, how tight is the relationship between sales and the aligned support people? And what is that alignment? What is each party responsible for directly? And is there a division of labor? I want comp focused primarily not just on the lagging indicator of revenue, mm -hmm. but also on the, on the sort of behavioral and leading indicators that are, that are key points in your, in your sales process and in, in the buyer's process. Um, w let's understand what the value chain is. Um, I'd be inclined to do a pooled comp for most teams, you know, with some leverage, but, but you also, um, you also do, do an arbitrage function, right? You risk mitigate it a little bit if you spread it because most uh, pre-sales teams are, tend to be more sort of area focused. For, you, know, you might have several regions, but your, your SEs work in an area. So that also, um, that also takes some of the, of the risk down. Um, um, so unless you have tight one-to-one, -one, you know, AM to SE, mm -hmm. or, or very discreet two-to-one, three-to-one, where it's very clear, uh, you, you wouldn't want to tie those people directly. And then finally, I'll give you a, a recent um, two, frankly, two almost identical clients, different spaces, which is interesting. Um, they had SEs that were, hev that were pooled, heavily pooled. I mean, now I'm like round robin, wow. um, catch as catch can. But they had comp for whatever reason. Um, I mean, maybe for a previous regime or whatever, they hadn't changed. Comp was aligned to individual groups of reps. So you had some reps just making huge dough. Some of the, some of the pre-sales guys making huge dough, and the other guys get killed. You know, based on the fact that you you got the right or the wrong guy. Um, so you know, comp was already misaligned. Needed to be fixed. Let me throw a couple on that for the benefit of Cheryl, who's asked the question. If I were to design a plan for the pre-sales engineers, these are some of the things that I would think about. First of all, go get some benchmarks. And I don't mean to invest silly in benchmarking. Just make sure that you've got the OTE, the on-target earnings, are in the right area. But then once you've got those, you're going to need to slice it up differently. Instead of having that old 70-30 or 75-25 plan, when you have investment in incentive compensation, which gives you an upside potential, you have to slide that on down. 50-50, 60-40, and those are areas in which case some pre-sales people may have to take a salary cut yep. to have the possibility of the gain on the upside if they drive the right behavior. So there's a real risk return there that these people are going to have to want to make. Secondly, design the plan so it's aligned with the functional strategy. So with regard to sales, don't just make it in a, in, in a vacuum. Take this pre-sales plan, align it with the sales plan, in many cases similar metrics, and then make sure that plan is aligned to the functional strategy for sales. Automate the compensation plan so that it can be tracked. So if you're asking the pre-sales people to do something for which you're going to then pay them incentive compensation, then make sure you're measuring it because nobody will, will hit the, the, the dial quicker and faster than a pre-sales engineer <laughs> to make sure that they're changing their behaviors to meet a new... And a new, they will understand the, what they're supposed to be paid to 16 decimal places. Oh, will they ever. So they, look they'll, out. They'll build the calculator faster than you can buy it. So... Uh, and then la uh, second to last is get a compensation committee to approve this. Don't just make this about you and what you're doing inside the pre-sales function. Yep. Get a wider buy-in again, part of that sort of functional, uh, cross-functional alignment. And lastly, watch for the desired behaviors. Do they materialize? Because Murphy's Law runs rampant off of the compensation plan yep. changes, right? Unintended effects begin to be released and suddenly you might even you might even get the desired behavior but you get more undesired behaviors that weren't part of the picture so make sure that you're looking out for murphy's law as well yeah personally in my career um the places where i've most made a monkey out of myself and that's saying something <laughs> yeah. um is um is un uh, unintended consequences i was so sure that this brilliant comp idea was yeah. really going to work out and then it went sideways yeah. so not surprising um, yeah all right great points by both sides but I think we can all agree that the comp plans for pre-sales may need to change. And again, the comp plans should always motivate the desired behaviors and results. There's another resource that I want to point out to our audience, our quarterly magazine. The SBI magazine also dives into compensation planning in articles like the one in our Q3 edition titled, Sales Compensation, Are You In Line or Off The Rail? Let's take a short break and direct everybody to subscribe to the SBI magazine, and we'll be right back. Making your number is hard. Your problems are complex. Complex problems need complex solutions. Introducing the SBI Magazine. Read in-depth stories written by award-winning journalists about how your peers have overcome their problems to make the numbers. When you need more than a tweet, social post, or blog article, 
turn to the SBI Magazine. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com to subscribe. Welcome back. My name is Christina Dickmeyer, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Mike Drapeau and Kevin Avery, for today's show, Are You Too Quick to Pull the Comp Trigger? Today, we are talking about the aspect of strategy that relates to compensation planning. And in our third segment, let's turn to results. Oftentimes, new sales leaders implement a variety of improvement programs, and one of them is compensation planning. When positive results roll in, it can be confusing to determine just exactly what it was that made the difference. Was compensation a key part of the results achieved? Was it neutral? Or possibly, was it even a drag to the performance? Kevin and Mike, tell us, how do you know? Well, I love this question, Christine, I really do, because uh, it captures the dilemma we all face, which is we live in this, this parallel world where everything is happening simultaneously. You don't want to stack the improvement efforts sack back to back like boxcars. You want things to happen at the same time. So you can't uh, isolate the variables, like we used to say in the chem lab. So if you're looking for a cut and dried answer to be able to say out of the gate every time it's the comp plan or isn't the comp plan, you're really not going to find it, not, at least not an honest answer. Yeah, you know, I want to go back to early in my career, my first boss who was a CEO, um, actually when I was a sales guy in my second job, um, he used to say to me, hey, give yourself a raise, sell more. <laughs> Brett Shockley, if you're in the audience, that one never gets old. <laughs> I've used it a hundred times. Um, so my point here is that as a new head of sales, most heads of sales are tempted by things that they probably shouldn't be. Um, you know, it is inconceivable that I can't think of more impactful things to do than to change the comp plan. Comp plans seem so easy, but again, we talked about unten unintended consequences. But take a look at the, again, at the SBI um, five-step sales strategy methodology. Compensation, the best leaders at the level five companies are consistently doing the right things, uh, and, they're, and they're doing them in sequence where, where, um, where feasible. Um, and comp falls at the end of step three of five, uh, with about 70 odd items ahead of it to consider. Mm. So sequence is really important. Um, here's a few things I would be asking myself, um, and uh, I would you know, sort of take it up a level. One, I'm coming in new. Where am I coming from and who am I replacing, right? So um, unless you're in a brand new startup, um, you're inheriting a, 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 a strategy. So are you inheriting a sound strategy or one that's loaded with uh, opportunity? Um, the second thing is, is there a corporate strategy? Now let's say that I lost my mind and I didn't nail this down in the interview process, um, but you've got to figure that out, right? We talked about if you don't have a corporate strategy, you're at the end of the crack, the whip, look out. Um, do my peers have strategies? Um, do they accord with mine and each other or do they conflict? You know, this gives you a sense of the risk that you're inheriting as you come in. Other things, how's my talent pipeline? Do I actually have a talent pipeline? Sometimes if a sales leader has been fired for being ineffective, uh, and if it was a good firing, uh, part of what they've screwed up is talent. And I would tack on a couple additional things, Kevin, to your list. Maybe, where is my low-hanging fruit? Uh, do I have any access to quick wins? Yeah. Um, what sort of some tactical things I can do right now to, to goose up revenue in the short term and increase my visibility to the business without disorienting everybody and causing additional work. Yep. Um, and some, some of these things are subtle too. Imp maybe improving the forecast process. Maybe I can stop lying. I mean, I can stop <laughs> modifying my, my forecast. You don't and have to start lying. A start lying, yeah. I can separate the pipeline from the upside. Do things like that to give some credibility to what I'm managing up the, uh, up the chain. Maybe even implement a sort of a war room so that I can get the best, the best of breed from my company to help me bring down some deals. Yep, and I mean, I, you know, if you think about changing the comp plan, you're, you're new, whatever, um, you're probably thinking on your leadership team, you're also thinking of your sales team, your, your A players. Um, you know, you wanna think, do I have flight risks of key people? Mm -hmm. But, but uh, the broadsword approach to slash and you know, what at it uh, is probably the wrong uh, approach to this. I don't need a broad stroke comp change in order to take care of the flight risks of key people. You know, I'd rather target them individually. And here's my, my recommendation for how to do that. In general, um, I, I want a situation that I want to pay for a midterm retention in, a, in an amount that actually motivates them to stay, but I also want it to be factored for results because I want them to continue to have skin in the game, not just hang around to protect the, protect the bonus mm -hmm. and meanwhile be looking for a job. Um, you know, frankly, someone for whom that's not enough, you know, I can do without. I, you know, you don't want to lose people except that if they're not fully in, they should be out. So I can attrit people if they're not really committed. 
And let me circle back around to the original genesis of the question, which was how do I separate between whether or not the good things that happened were because of the comp plan change I made or because of other things or maybe a bit of both. So let me try to give some guidance questions along the, that perspective so that you can ask that and get that question answered by yourself. So the first is, what were the specific behaviors that you wanted to have changed by the plan? Not increase revenue or whatever, but what are specific behaviors that you can meter to see whether or not the plan changed those behaviors? And then uh, to, uh, look at CRM data usage, for instance, or maybe look at job plan, job, job aid utilization, things that you can say, did a behavior change or is it just revenue? Right. So I would also look at the turnover. What was the turnover rate with your, say, your frontline sales reps before the plan change, and what was your turnover rate after the plan change? So was there a difference, and were the people, when they're going through their exit interviews, were they fingering the plan, saying, hey, I'm leaving because of this. This thing is a turd, and I'm not going to stand for it, and by the way, uh, no, neither will my, my, my peers who are heading out the door shortly. That's a technical term, by and, the way. That's exactly, right. yeah. Uh, and then also, the flip side of that is, okay, now that a bunch of people have left, have you been able to attract better talent with the same plan? Okay, right. here's my new plan. I'm waiting out into the marketplace, trying to attract some new buyers, people to come to my company and be a field sales rep. Can I do that? Or am I less effective, let's say, last year with the old plan? And then um, do I see sort of what we would call a change in the dispersion about the mean? I'm sorry to get technical on this, but if you look at comp or quota attainment, assuming you don't change territory allocations, with a better plan, you're moving more people from sort of the muddle in the middle closer to that sort of higher achievement, over 100%. And maybe you're reining in some of the 259% quota people down less, and you're kind of getting a plan where you maximize revenue, more people are achieving. Or did what you have is sort of you separate it out, you, you, you squash down the bulge, and you have a whole bunch of people that are not making their number, in which case you can almost set your watch to more turnover. My brain hurts. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. All right. Um, you know, Mike, that was a heck of a list, and it's clearly something you've given some thought to and have some passion about. Sorry about um, that. Stupefied. <laughs> um, you know, the, the other thing I'll say to a new sales leader is this. Remember, you've got about 100 days, give or take, um, no matter what anybody told you coming in the door. Um, and Remember that anything that's broken, and uh, you know, at that at the point of uh, your hundred days, give or take, is going to attach to you like a boil on well wh wherever. <laughs> Let's say a limpet. How about that? Um, you know, so if I need something extraordinary as a, a as an ascending sales leader, the time is now. Mm. Um, the CEO, the board, um, the private equity firm, what have you, is much likelier to give you the amount of rope you ask for early. Uh, than, than if you wait and ask for it because you surface your challenges because you haven't done a quick enough diagnosis uh, after your grace period. So the final thing to assess, I would say then, is can I do this myself and can I move fast enough? Mm -hmm. If not, I need to get me some ninjas. You got any black PJs, Mike? Uh, if I told you that, I'd probably have to kill you. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> All right, guys. So what I gained from this discussion is that you must look at all pieces of the puzzle. When looking at results, you need to analyze the data from multiple sources and factor in other critical drivers as well. If you've enjoyed this segment, I encourage you to listen to the July 27th podcast with Bill Sexton, the VP of Sales Operations for Zebra Technologies, who discusses how he consolidated a large number of complicated plans into five simple compensation frameworks. We're going to take one more break and direct our audience on how to subscribe to the SBI podcast. And when we come back, we'll wrap up today's show. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI podcast. SBI podcast listeners get unique insight into real-world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying today's show. Are you too quick to pull the comp trigger? Mike and Kevin, thanks so much for sharing your opinions today. Our audience benefited greatly from hearing your views on how to design and execute effective compensation programs. You want to make sure you have a deep understanding of sales strategy, which includes compensation planning, and why it's important. Get a copy of this year's research report called How to Make Your Number in 2016, 
at www.salesbenchmarkindex.com slash 2016 report. If you want to take it a step further, you can have one of our experts lead you through a workshop which will detail how to do this. Go to www.salesbenchmarkindex.com slash 2016 workshop. And finally, I also want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. For myself, Kevin, and Mike, we wish you much success as you try to make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.